Euh, chers amis, bonsoir. Merci beaucoup d'être venus nombreux euh, pour, pour assister à notre conférence euh, donc, qui a lieu à l'occasion de l'exposition Léonie Douspinski, le mystère de l'icône. Voilà. Et euh, merci beaucoup à l'archimandrite euh, Patrick Doulan qui est venu de Californie pour nous parler de Léonie Douspinski et de, son, de ses études, de, de son étude de l'icône avec lui, de son expérience d'iconographe et de peintre. Euh, L'archimandrite euh, Patrick est le supérieur du monastère de Saint-Grégoire-le-Sinaïte en Californie. Et voilà, il a sept frères qui vivent avec lui. Il est venu avec le père Moïse qui est son compagnon et son collaborateur pour peindre de, des fresques et des icônes. Voilà. Et euh, je vous passe la parole. Euh, please come. Le, le père euh, archimandrite euh, Patrick va parler en anglais. Je pense que tout le monde comprend l'anglais. Et de toute façon, ensuite, nous allons publier le texte français de la conférence sur le site d'orthodoxie.com et sur le site du diocèse aussi. Voilà. Et donc, euh, après, s'il y a quelques questions, des points euh, un peu, comment dire, incertains ou qui nécessitent plus d'explications, bien sûr, il faudra poser des questions, mais plutôt à la fin de la conférence. Merci. Merci. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Good evening, and uh, thank you, especially to Emily, uh, for inviting me and Father Moses. It has been a great joy for us, and to see this wonderful exhibition, uh, some icons which I've never seen before, some icons which are familiar, is, a, is a, not just a joy, but it's a great benefit for a working icon painter uh, to hear our teacher speaking to us through these icons is a, well, it's a wonderful experience and I thank you for it. So I share with you a little bit about being a pupil of Uspensky and specifically a pupil of Uspensky towards the end of his life. I met Leonid and Lydia Uspensky In 1981, I had been Orthodox, I had been a member of the Orthodox Church for a year and a half only by that point. I had been studying icons on my own, meeting iconographers in the United States as much as I could. Going to, I lived in the city of Boston, so there were iconographers at the various Orthodox seminaries and churches. So I had been studying. Uh, full-time, we might say, as much as I possibly could. But uh, I sensed that in all of these studies, something was missing. My spiritual father, uh, and the man who was the rector of my parish, he had traveled in France and knew some of the Orthodox people in France and had heard that Leni Duspensky was still painting, still carving icons. Uh, still teaching. And so on my behalf, my spiritual father wrote to Uspensky and said, I have a young man here in the United States, a parishioner of mine. If he comes to Paris, would you please see him? He studies icon painting and he's very serious about it. Uh, and that's all that we asked for. He did not ask if I could come and study with the master because We did not want to presume on his time, which we knew must be very valuable to him. Uh, so I came to, uh, 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 we received a very short letter from uh, Mr. Uspensky, uh, and uh, he said that he would see me when I came to Paris uh, if I would consent to share his evening meal. And he said the language will probably be a problem but my wife speaks a little English. So that's what we had. And uh, I came to Paris without a great deal of expectation uh, in the sense of asking to be really taught. I just wanted to meet him. I'd also been told that there were many of his icons and those of Father Gregory in the various churches. And of course, I hoped to see them. I arrived in Paris. I called to the Uspenskys. And, uh, of course, I spoke with Madame Uspensky, who told me to come the next day for dinner 
and to bring my questions. So I had many questions and I, I, I looked at them and suddenly the questions didn't look very good to me. I, I started to get a little nervous. I was quite nervous, quite frightened to meet this great man who I had already met to some degree in his writings. I had read the meaning of icons, I had read the theology of the icons, and uh, I set off the next day. The Uspenskys received me with that graciousness for which they were well known. Uh, in my case, perhaps a little extra forbearance and graciousness, because in my nervousness and in my, uh, uh, in my ignorance, I got lost on the way. I didn't quite understand how the door worked at 39 Rue Breguet, and anyone who studied with the Uspenskys knows what I mean. It was a complicated entrance. I was three hours late. And I, by the time I arrived, I was cold, wet, frightened, exhausted, crying. I was, I was really quite frightened. Uh, but once they let me into the apartment, uh, their warmth, their graciousness, their sense of Christian hospitality uh, put me at ease. And of course, immediately, Madame Uspensky started feeding me. I had to eat by myself because they had eaten hours earlier. Um, and uh, while I'm eating, they're asking me questions about my family and who am I? How did I come to the Orthodox faith? How did I come to an interest in icon painting? Um, and then when dinner was finished, Mr. Uspensky spoke for the first time and said, so what are your questions? And suddenly my mind went a little blank. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was really, again, nervous and frightened. But I had questions. I had been trying to paint icons, trying to draw, reading about iconography. So I had many questions, and I simply started asking them. The first questions were all technical things. What kind of pigment? What kind of brushes? What sort of preparation? But we did not speak very long on technical matters, because he immediately pointed out to me, egg tempera is a very simple medium. You will learn it if you practice, if you study it, if you continue in a serious way. Well, so we talked a little bit about recipes and things like that, but and pretty quickly, the conversation switched to the theology, the meaning, the history of icons. We talked about their purpose. How are icons made? How are they composed? How does the icon painter respond to the various requests that are made of the painter in the course of working. And this conversation went on for a very, very long time. In fact, it was about one o'clock in the morning when Madame Uspensky uh, turned to me and said, and now Mr. Doolin, my last name, we must turn you out. Uh, something that she would say to me many times in the course of the several years that followed. But during that first night, he examined very closely the things that I had brought with me, photographs of painted icons, and I had brought a number of drawings and sketches, uh, mostly uh, works that were taken from medieval and mostly Russian icons. Uh, so he looked at all the sketches and he said, well, Taksabia, and that's all that he said, not bad, Pamal, um, but he looked at the photographs, and he got a very serious look on his face as he looked from one to the next. Um, he said to me, these are exact copies of other icons. I said, yes, I'm, I, that's what I'm trying to do. In fact, he knew immediately that my process of icon painting involved taking a book or a photograph, putting a piece of tracing paper onto the photograph, tracing every line, and transferring this to a panel, and making an exact reproduction, as far as was possible, that was. And he immediately said to me, if you're going to be serious about painting icons, this stops. You must do your own drawing. You must learn yourself how to draw. You study the old icons, and you learn out of them 
but you do not simply reproduce them. And he said to me that first night uh, something that I took to heart, something that I'm sure he said to all the pupils one way or another, or at least those that needed to hear this. He said to me, in the 20th century, this was back in the 20th century, um, he said, icons are one of two things when they're painted. Usually they are exact mechanical reproductions of an older icon, or they are an individualistic, artistic fantasy. And he said the tradition of the church is neither of these two extremes, but it is creativity within the tradition. The iconographer creates within the tradition. And of course, we read this uh, beautifully stated in his own writings. Uh, speaking about the tradition of icon painting, he wrote in The Meaning of Icons, the church has repeatedly emphasized the necessity of following the tradition, either through the rulings of the councils or through the voice of its hierarchs, and enjoined that icons should be painted as the ancient holy iconographers painted them. The creation of the icon has a character of being Catholic, not personal, a Catholic, not personal creation. The usual, I see it like that, the usual, I understand it this way, is entirely excluded in the case of the Orthodox icon. So this is our teacher talking about adherence, understanding, and immersion in the faith in the tradition itself. And he taught that this immersion uh, in the teaching of the Holy Church on the icons is what gives the iconographer freedom. Freedom in two things. The artistic freedom to paint according to the holy faith. Uh, the theological content of the icon and the artistic execution of the icon itself. Now speaking about the painter's creativity, he said, and this is again from the meaning of icons, iconography is not copying. It is far from being impersonal, for to follow the tradition never shackles the creative powers of the iconographer, whose individuality expresses itself in the composition as well as the color and the line. And I think that these quotes uh, taken from the, uh, his uh, 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 initial essay in the, the in the uh, Meaning of Icons, uh, sums up what he said to us students in many different ways, but over and over and over. And I think it especially sums up and summarizes what he says to us in his work. And uh, we particularly can see this so beautifully spread before us in this exhibition that we have all been able to see. I believe that Uspensky's writing on the icon, and I believe that his manner of iconography and painting, carving, is supported by the evidence of the extant iconographic examples that have come down to us. If you take what Mr. Uspensky said in his writings, if you look at the body of his painted icons, you can see this approach and the things that he said in the icons coming down to us. When he spoke of the canon of iconography, he was referring not only to the actual canons, but the holy icons that have come down to us, uh, which those canons spoke of. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Right. So, if I don't make sense, please let me know, because it's, it's possible. He also said, also a meaning of icons, the absence of identical icons has been noted long ago. Indeed, among icons on the same subject, and although they are sometimes remarkably alike, 
we never find two absolutely identical icons, except in cases of deliberate copying in modern times. Icons are not copied. They are painted from, which means their free creative transposition. Uh, before coming up here tonight, Father Moses and I were back in the exhibition because we're going home so soon. We, we want to look at those icons as much as possible. We were looking tonight at the three icons from uh, L'Église du Saint-Esprit, Oskit, uh, the Domitian of the Mother of God, the Nativity, and the Crucifixion, especially the icon of the Crucifixion. If we look at it, and of course this is a relatively early icon, middle 1950s, I believe. We look at this icon, and it is very, very clear that this icon is based on an existing icon, that of Dionysi, uh, that very famous icon of the crucifixion. We can see so many elements that Uspensky took from the original icon and used in this icon. And in fact, it is a very, very close uh, work based on another work, and yet, we see all the elements in this icon that we will see in his later work. Uh, the beautiful, uh, luminous white background that envelops the figure of the Savior on the cross. The uh, subtle colors on the interior of the forms. The lyrical drawing. The strong contours. All of these features are there, but we see what he means by not copying an icon, but working from the icon, working out of the icon. And it's also probably interesting to note that this is a fairly early icon. Perhaps, and here I'm speculating, but I'm assuming, and perhaps the other students would have to uh, make sure that this is correct. As he goes through his life, as he is studying, learning, looking, painting, uh, he is becoming more and more able to simply paint without looking at another icon. One thinks of the comment that was made of Theophanes uh, the Greek in the 14th century in Russia, where someone is observing him, and with amazement this person says, he just draws without reference to another icon. But of course, our teacher was certainly able to do that. I asked him that first night, what tools do you use? And already, the, as I was saying it, the question seemed silly because coming into the little apartment where they lived, that beautiful but small place, I could see there weren't a lot of modern tools. It was quite obvious. And he was puzzled at the question and even said, what do you mean, what tools? I have brushes, I have pigments, I have boards. And I said, no, well, I mean, uh, do you use a ruler for making the straight line? Do you, how do you use the compass when you're making a halo? And he paused. And he looked at me very seriously. And he went like that. He said, the hand. The hand is the best tool. Now he said this in Russian. Then he said it in French, hoping I'd understand it. And then Madame Uspensky said it in English. <laughs> Uh, so I, I heard it. The question is, did I hear it? Uh, because this was the way it was with Uspensky. He would say short and simple things to you. And you would, you would listen to it, you would hear it, okay, I understand that. But then later on, you're going home on the metro, or you're flying home on the plane, or you're working in your studio, and these things come back to you. It was really quite remarkable in that respect. So, uh, halos, lines in the icon, are drawn freehand, as we say. Um, and we can see that again in the icons. This gave him a real sure hand. All of his pupils uh, had a chance to see this. He would often uh, be criticizing our work, uh, helping us, telling us what was good, what was not good, and sometimes uh, he would just sit down and he'd give us a real blessing, which was to work on our icon. And we're struggling and we're 
erasing and we're putting color and it's, it's, it, things are going from sometimes from bad to worse. And he would come in and mix up a color and put one line. And that one line changed the color on this side of the line and the color on that side of the line, didn't it? And you would say to yourself, how did he do that? It was my brush, my color. I couldn't do it, but he did. Uh, and we would see that often. Uh, it was quite a phenomenon. Uh, I left that night. Uh, my head was spinning a little bit. Um, I was thinking about the things that I had heard. I was very excited. Excited to paint with all of this new information. Some of the new information came to me because as he was explaining things, I noticed uh, uh, there was on the mantel, uh, there was a small mantel over the fireplace in the room. And of course, as the students know, several icons on this mantel facing the wall. And once in a while, he would take an icon and show it to me. This was his own work in progress. Several icons in different stages of production. He would show me what he meant by looking at his own icons, but also by looking in books of old icons that he was looking at. And looking at these panels, if I had not done anything else but come from America and seen those panels, it would have been enough reason for making the journey. Because one could see him working his way from the sketch to the colors to the finished parts of the icon little by little, and uh, it's hard to put into words my surprise when I saw it, because the icon painters that I had learned from in the United States, iconography was a very rule by rule, number by number process. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and with Uspensky, it was not the way. The icon was painted from beginning to end, I realized later on when we were working, it was hard to see where the drawing stopped and the painting started. The, the boundary between these two things was very vague because the painting became the colors. The colors became the finished icon. And it remained fresh, lively, beautiful from the beginning to the end. It was quite remarkable. Uh, I returned to the place where I was staying. I didn't know what was going to happen. Before I left, the Uspenskys uh, said, uh, Madame Uspensky said, uh, how long are you going to be in Paris? I said, well, I don't actually have a, a ticket to return to the United States. I don't know. And they looked at each other, and they were quiet. And they didn't say anything. So I left, and I didn't know if I would see him again. But I thought it was absolutely a defining evening. So I was very pleased with it anyway. Uh, the next morning uh, at the house I was staying, the, uh, uh, the Uspenskys rang up and they said to, uh, I was staying with Father Stephen and Matushka Ann Headley. Um, and uh, Madame Uspensky said to Father Stephen, uh, tell that young man that Leonid will accept him as a pupil and he's to come to the class at the Rue Petel on Saturday with some paper and a pencil. And with that, I became a pupil of Uspensky, uh, joining a large group of people that had come before me. And uh, I, I went to the class. Uh, before I go on, let me say that it's a good time to say I became a pupil of Leonid Uspensky, but I always thought of myself as a pupil of the Uspenskys. Leonid and Lydia. I never really spoke to Leonid Uspensky until the very last years that I knew him without Madame Uspensky translating. He spoke Russian, she translated into English, I spoke English, she translated back into Russian. As I remember us speaking, sitting at the little table at the Rue Breguet, we all seemed to be talking at the same time. There was no lapse, there was no lag, and this was due to Madame Uspensky. She was a brilliant linguist. She was a truly great translator. It was something amazing. But also, she was a teacher and a scholar in her own right. Um, she, 
contributed from her own vast understanding and experience in the theology, the history, and the painting of icons. So I saw them both absolutely as my teachers. I was privileged to join that wonderful class on the Rue Breguet, um, and there are uh, people among us, uh, Anne Filipenko um, and Emily, who are still teaching this very class, so it continues uh, to our joy. But by that point, uh, Professor Uspensky had been teaching this class for almost 30 years, if my math is correct. Uh, he was assisted in those days by the able Natasha Magdanovich, who I also learned a lot from. And in fact, it was an important aspect of studying with Uspensky. One got to learn from the other pupils. So I won't talk much about the class because the teachers of the class are with you. Um, and uh, they can speak about it far better than I. But just to note that it was a wonderful thing to be with the master and the master's pupils. He spoke to each one during the class, criticizing their work, helping them with what they were doing, and we could all listen to the same questions that we had ourselves asked by someone else, maybe in a slightly different way. And of course, uh, the pupils interacted and taught one another with his encouragement. I spent my days uh, during those fir that first month that I was in Paris drawing, only sketching. Uh, and to do this, I spent much time at the Church of the Three Hierarchs on the Rue Pétel and the Church of uh, Our Lady Joy of All Who Sorrow and Saint Genevieve on the Rue Victor Saint Victor working and drawing from icons of Father Gregory, of course, and Mr. Uspensky. I owed a great deal to that wonderful man, the guardian, Vladimir, of the uh, Rue Pétel. And God loved me. He was very kind to me, and he spent a lot of time guarding me. Because we icon students take a long time when we look at icons, paint icons, and draw. And uh, he really was uh, a great, a great help to me, and very kind to take the time to do that. Creativity and the tradition. For Uspensky, these two things were not opposed to each other. They were indispensable to orthodox iconography, creativity and the tradition. To my mind, this his work appears to be executed in a very ancient style, and yet at the same time, a very modern style. And I think this is something that is noted by people who know old icons and see his icons. This also explains why different people can still regard Uspensky's work in such different ways. I have heard people uh, saying that he is excessively conservative, absolutely inflexible, in matters of the icon's content. And that is, that is, that is quite true. Um, but we would not say excessively conservative. Others find his work modern and individualistic. And these two opposing views can be, uh, these people can be regarding the same icon. Uh, this is because his work is ancient, is traditional. It also is modern. It also is personal. I believe also that one has to keep in mind that he and Father Gregory worked in connection with their colleagues, namely the members of the Brotherhood of St. Photius the Great. They laid their work before these other Orthodox scholars, uh, the theologians, the musicians, the hymnographers, and the canonists, those who studied the Holy Canon. Creativity within such a community as this must have been the ideal environment for them, particularly in their early years, where one understands, and Madame Uspensky told me this, they were asking themselves, what does the icon look like? We are in the 20th century. We are in France. We are painting icons that will be seen by people who are new coming into the church. It was not a foregone conclusion to them exactly what these icons would look like. And certainly, in the exhibition that is before us, we can see a development 
of style and a selection of style through the years. It's, it's terribly interesting to look at the exhibition bearing that in mind. They laid their work before the others as they asked what is an icon. And I think the fact that they asked this question of themselves, of each other, I think that's of great importance to remember and to understand how his work develops. I think that, and this is just an opinion of mine, so, so, so beware, I think that this is part of what makes their work so beautiful, magisterial, and at the same time humble and quiet. I passed that first month with just drawing. Uh, Uspensky said nothing about painting. He said, keep drawing for now. So I drew and I drew and I drew. Um, and it was wonderful because drawing gives us a certain freedom. We're not paint drawing for this specific icon, for this specific person. So we, we really move about in the world of icons by drawing. And Uspensky said to me, always draw. He said, when you start painting, keep drawing. He said, it's absolutely necessary, at least for you. Um, by the second month, he told me it was time to start painting. He gave me the list of materials. I went to Sennelier and all the wonderful shops of Paris, the, the wood shop uh, uh, around the corner from their apartment, bought materials, made the panels, and started my icons. I had no idea what I was doing, in spite of what I had seen already. Um, it was really uh, a, little, a little daunting. Usually, uh, uh, as I went to church on the Rue Saint-Victor at, uh, at uh, Our Lady Joy of Al Husaro, where the Uspenskys also uh, attended services on the weekend, after liturgy on Sunday, Madame Uspensky would come over and say, Mr. Doolin, when she called me Mr. Doolin, I always paid extra attention because I knew that I was being ordered to do something or reprimanded. Uh, she said, Mr. Doolin, can you come on Tuesday this week? I would say, yes, yes, of course. Uh, I, I had no other uh, function to be in Paris except to learn from them. So uh, they'd pick a day, and I would go at about lunchtime, spend the afternoon. We would have supper, more questions, more talking. And then at a certain point, it would be time, as Madame Uspensky would say, it's time for us to turn you out. I pack up my things, and off we go. I am a very forgetful sort of person, and almost every time I left something behind. Giving Madame the Uspensky the opportunity to call me and say, well, this time you've left some brushes, or this, or that, or this, or that. Um, she, she found that rather funny. Working together uh, through the years, uh, and let me say, I tried to come back to Paris every year. For as many months as I could, that usually meant three to five months. 1982, I did not come to, I, so the first year I was with Uspensky, five months, 1981. Uh, 1982, I wasn't able to come back to Paris, but Uspensky sent a pupil to the United States to St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in New York to teach, and that was Helena Nikkanen from Finland, who was an iconographer and a noted icon restorer. And she taught a beautiful pair of classes at St. Vladimir's, a lecture course, the history and the theology of the icon, and a painting course modeled on Uspensky's Saturday afternoon course. So we pupils in America were able to uh, partake of Uspensky's teaching. Uh, Helena was able to speak with Uspensky's voice. And uh, they were very pleased with her work they were very pleased with her in general. And uh, for us in America, this was a great opportunity. I have uh, two colleagues that I work with rather closely to this day, and uh, we worked together in Helena's class. Uh, then uh, the follow uh, in 1983 and 1984, I lived in Thessalonica, Greece, the end of 1983 and through 84. So being close by, I saw the Uspenskys a lot that year. Um, it was a great opportunity and a great time for me, and I was able to uh, obey the command. The best teachers, he said, are the old icons. And he said to me, you're very young, so you have to go. 
go to where the icons are. He said, not just photographs, go to where the icons are, look at them. And then Madame Uspensky said, and look at them with six eyes. I understood what she meant. So uh, I was able to do that. Of course, living in Thessalonica, one is close to a wealth of ancient iconography, especially the wall paintings. And he was very interested to hear reports on the icons, the churches, everything. When I came back, I was absolutely uh, drilled with questions about the places I had seen. Because, of course, the Uspenskys had not traveled to the Balkans. They did not know uh, the churches except by photographs in books. And so when I came back, I was asked about specific churches. They wanted to know. And one understood that when we went to see these churches, we were also their, their eyes. And it helped us to look. It helped us to, to, to look more, to look with those six eyes. Uh, one interesting example of a conversation that we had. Uh, he asked me, I had seen the church of St. Nicholas Orphanos in Thessalonica, and also the church of the Savior in Kora in Constantinople. <coughs> he said, tell me about this blue background. He says, it's so dark, it's black. I said, no, it's not black. So he took out the photographs that he could see. I will say most of the photographs that he was looking at were already in the early 1980s old photographs. They really weren't very good. And I said, this photograph does not show the colors that you see when you're there. Of course, he understood that because who knew better than our teacher the colors of a real icon and the colors of a photograph of an icon. So he knew that. He said, tell me about that. Tell me especially about this blue background. Because as you know, when he painted a church, the backgrounds are light and white for the most part. Uh, I said, this blue background is not black. It's blue. It's gray. It's very varied. In some churches, it's rather light. In other churches, it's deep, depending on the condition of the wall paintings. But what happens with all of these churches is the deep, dark background, the faces and the garments and the forms are illuminated as if coming out of this deep darkness. And he said, oh, now I understand the attraction of this blue background. So that was interesting. Um, he wanted to go and have a look, but uh, he was quite old by this point because remember, I am working with him in the last six years of his life. He was vigorous and healthy, as, as we know, during most of that time. One day, he was criticizing my icons because I would come in, I would have four or five icons in progress, I put them on the table before him, and I'm listening for the criticism. It was always practical, it was always useful. It always made me want to go home and paint. It was always somewhat challenging and liberating. But one time he was looking at the icons, and this was in the later years that I was studying with him. It was probably 1985 or six. He was looking at the icons, and Madame Uspensky was standing there also looking, and he was criticizing a robe that I had painted on one of the figures. And this robe was blue, it was dark, the paint was thick, I had put it on, take it off, put it on, put it, tried different things, that, and it really was not well done. He was looking at it, he said, this paint is too, and of course he's speaking Russian, and he's saying a word. Madame Uspensky is trying to think of the word, and as I said, remember, we're always talking at the same time, the three of us, and I suggested the word, and she translated what I said to Mr. Uspensky, and he said, yes. Yes, and then he said to her, I told you, he understands Russian. You don't need to translate. And I said, no, I, I don't understand a word of Russian. And I really did not at the time. But how did I know the word that he was supplying? Because this happened often. I began to realize at this time, when I put my icons in front of him, they look different to me immediately. Because what's happening is, 
when you study with a master, and I think this happened with all the students of Uspensky, when you study with a master, you begin to see with the eyes of the master. You, you hope and you begin, with God's help, to appropriate the vision of the master. Maybe it's just a little bit, but you do, it does happen. And so each time they put the icon down, I'm thinking, oh, that blue is awful, it's heavy. And these lines are in the wrong place. And this is, I could begin to anticipate the criticism. And I, did it happen? Did oh, it happen? It, it, it's, it, did, you, did you think it happened? Yeah. It was a common experience, and for Joris as well. It was a common experience with us, and it's something that we can look for even today. We come back to an exhibition like this, or the churches, we see these icons. When I'm painting, and most of my time, by the way, is spent fresco painting, a very different medium, I sometimes think, if Uspensky was standing next to me, what would he say about what I'm doing? And I see it differently. Father Moses and I, a number of years ago, were painting frescoes in Vézelay at the church of St. Germain d'Auxerre and uh, St. Marie Madeleine. And uh, we were visited by our friend Grégoire Aslanov and his wife Irina. And they actually helped us a little bit, mixing the plaster, putting the paint on. And just having an, a colleague Another student of Uspensky made us see our work a little differently. It, it made us paint a little more Uspensky-like. So that we students can help each other to do that. He was able to address the strengths and the weaknesses of a student. And he could be very, very clear about this. He told me, your strengths are drawing, composition, and looking at the icon. And he said to me once, you really know how to look at an icon, so keep doing that, because you need to learn more. So, drawing, composition, draftsmanship were my strengths, my weaknesses, color, painting, paint quality. What he, what he always said, and I think this is a Russian word, material, not just what color is this? But how is this color? Is it transparent? Is it opaque? Are the lines fast? Are the lines slow? Uh, is it heavy contrast? Is it light contrast? These are my weaknesses. And he said, also, my weakness, you are too conventional, too conservative. And this was, this was very valuable to understand. As he understood by nature, I was overly conservative. If I saw a great icon, no matter what school it was, medieval Russian, late Byzantine, middle Byzantine, Father Gregory, Leonid Uspensky, if I saw a great icon, it's hard for me to leave that icon behind. I want to paint that way. He understood that this is a good thing, but also a potential difficulty. So he emphasized to me the importance of being creative when I painted with students who had a tendency to too much individualism, flights of artistic fancy. He emphasized the need to study, learn, and follow the tradition. So he would balance in his students what he found lacking. And this was a great great benefit. He told me, when you go back to America, don't ever work in a Greek style one day, a Russian style the next day, depending on what your patrons want, and then an American style, whatever that might be, the next day. He said, just paint orthodox icons. The rest will take care of itself. Um, and that was useful because returning to the United States, becoming somebody who paints icons for various individuals, one is tempted to paint this way for this person, this way for this church. It was a very important piece of advice. He was a very, very severe teacher when necessary. One day, I worked with him. I was there early that day. I think we were making Olifa. 
So the, uh, stirring the alifa, I had to be there early and uh, working a long time. But we had a very important lesson, and he said some very severe things to me, and I was really a little upset. Later on, Emily came and joined us. He was dictating to us a recipe for fresco painting. Uh, and Emily could see, she could see I'd been crying, and I, I looked like I was very tired or something. And Uspensky noticed that Emily could see this, or maybe you asked, I, I don't recall. But Uspensky said to Emily, don't worry about him. I had to be very severe with him today because he's going home soon and he has a lot of things he has to learn. So he's okay. Um, and what had he had said that made me cry? It did. But it was one of the best days I ever had with him. Uh, well, I tended to say that about every day that we had with him. One felt that way. Uh, we, he was looking again. I had painted an icon of the Savior. And I had drawn it, I had painted it, I had taken things off, put them on. The, the panel was very, as is typical for me, overworked. And he said, at one point he said, can't you see this color does not go with this color? And I said, no, I can't see that. And he said, you are not really much of a painter, are you? Maybe I say that in another way you are not a natural painter. And I said, no, no, I'm not. Tears started, I was tired. It was... So he said, he kept instructing. He said, you're not a natural painter. So that's what you work on. You are a natural draftsman. You draw naturally. In fact, he said, you draw now as well as you ever need to. He said, but you're always going to have to work on painting, color, material, paint quality, one color going with another. This is what you will always struggle with. And then he said something very interesting. He said, I am a natural painter. I think the way one must think to paint. So he made that quite, I think, accurate and humble assessment of himself. He was a natural painter. He said, you are not a natural painter, so you must work on this aspect of painting the icon. After I began to think about this lesson, again, I found this very liberating. And I, I am blessed by this advice until today. It's over 30 years later. I am still blessed by this advice because I still have to work on color. Drawing is still my strong point. Color is still my weak place. So happily, I have colleagues that I can call in and we can say, what needs fixing here? Uh, so that was very important. Then he told me to do something. I made a suggestion. He said, you know, Father Gregory had trouble with color. I was very surprised by that because what do we think of when we think of Father Gregory but the mo some of the most beautiful combinations of colors the world has ever known? He said, Gregory... It sounded funny to hear Father Gregory referred to by the first name this way, but the intimacy between them came out when he spoke of him. He said Gregory, would, if he was having trouble with color, he'd take another icon of a different subject, but an icon where the colors were beautiful and use those colors for different parts of the icon that he was painted. He would see this red against this white background, and he would use it as part of this icon. And this is how he learned to understand color and use color. And again, I thought that was a very helpful piece of information. In 19, I think it was 86, uh, Uspensky asked me to do some cleaning and repainting of the walls of the Rue Pétel, which I did that year quite a bit. Um, it was very, very difficult but it was under his direction, and uh, I was very, very careful to understand that I was filling in holes, not repainting. So I am not a conserver or a restorer, but he asked me to do this, and uh, uh, with, uh, again, with Natasha's assistance and getting materials and everything, uh, at the time, uh, especially the wall paintings of Father Gregory in the altar at the Church of the Three Hierarchs, were, they were really uh, falling apart. 
Uh, they needed to be cleaned a little bit. I, Uspensky told me what to do, what to use, how to go. I took photographs. He came in. He looked at what was going on. He was pleased, so it went uh, okay. And uh, I prayed then, as I pray now, that I didn't ruin anything. But uh, these wall paintings have been cleaned and restored by several hands since that time. But at that time, while I was doing this uh, cleaning and uh, painting, I brought an icon to uh, Professor Uspensky, and he said to Madame Uspensky, this is pretty good. Not bad, he said, Taksebia. When I got Taksebia, I was thrilled. And he, he pointed to a few details of the icon that he liked. It was unusual. And he said to Madame Uspensky, ah, it's because he's painting on Gregory's work. It's, it is it is coming out in his own work. And I thought that was humble, because of course I thought it was his teaching, his advice, the things he was saying, but also certainly one understood that one was working in a school, a school of Uspensky and Krug. A little bit on the technique of iconography, but just a little bit because Uspensky describes very beautifully in the meaning of icons, in the article, the technique of iconography, the, uh, the process that he uses, the, the panel preparation, the drawing, the addition of colors, the highlights, the finishing of the icon, and so forth. Um, and although these are the essential steps that he used, it must be said that he didn't always follow them strictly. He, in fact, the very first thing that he said to me when I went for my first lesson, when we were painting, he mixed a little bit of paint in the palm of his hand. I can still see it. I can still see that little bit of paint there. He was painting, and then he looked over to me, and he could see that I was really paying attention. And he said, something that surprised me, something that I know he said to everybody, there are no rules. And I thought, I don't understand what he means. There's no rules. We've been talking about canons. We've been talking about the church fathers. We've been talking about the liturgical prayers of the church, all forming the icon, explaining the icon, celebrating the icon. We've been talking about rules constantly since I met him. What does he mean there's no rules? He wasn't talking about the content of the icon. He was talking about the artistic process of making the icon. Um, and especially by my day, he refrained from giving us recipes of color uh, other than for the sankir color, the first color that's put where the skin is going to go. All that I receive from him is it's usually a mixture of yellow ochre, red ochre, and a little black. That was all I got. It was up to me to try those in different combinations, different weights, even different amounts of medium added to the colors. It was up to me to work and explore and find my way in that. Of course, then one got to see him working. One would then go home, work all week, come back, and then if you got a chance to see him work again, then it really meant something that you could remember. Because you've ha spent the whole week having difficulties, problems, painting badly, but you had to do all of that to understand what he was doing when he put those colors onto that board. He made it look easy, didn't he? He made it look easy the way that he did it. Um, and this is important. He said to me, Icon icon iconography is so difficult because it's so simple. And I thought, simple? It's not simple, it's very difficult. But I don't know if it's the same in English. Simple can mean not difficult. It can also mean not complicated. Perhaps in French it's facile and simple. Is it, is it works? La même chose. And I thought, oh, he doesn't mean iconography is difficult because it's so easy. It's not easy. It's very difficult. It's not complicated. And I thought, thus, I thought years later as this rang in my ears. Uh, and as I'm making an icon and overcomplicating and overworking, it's difficult because it's so simple. It can be difficult to get to simple. Very difficult, but we have to bear that in mind. 
as followers of Uspensky. I saw him once. He was making a, one of the last large projects was a series of the icons of the feasts of the church that he made for the church of St. Gregoire and St. Anastasia in Bernwiller in Alsace. The whole uh, series of feasts he made for the icon screen. He was painting the icon of the presentation of the Virgin in the temple. And when I saw it, it was all just colors, not a lot of sharp edges and lines, but in the midst of all these just barely begun colors, most of them fairly light, in the midst of this, the head and the shoulders, about that big, was the head of uh, the priest Zacharias, the face, the shoulders, totally finished. The rest of the icon just barely begun. And I said, this face is finished already. He said, I'm working out all the colors in that one little space. That one little space had the lightest colors, the darkest colors. And he worked out the whole color composition in that one little piece. And this, in a sense, breaks the rules of drawing colors, redrawing highlights. So he was able to break the rules when necessary. Um, and he spent a great deal of time on these uh, decisions. Some icons were painted with great difficulty, and he'd take it away and start it again. Madame Uspensky would say, oh, I came in and the icon was gone. It was there before I left the room. I came back, and now it's gone. Uh, I saw the great icon that we have here of Saint Genevieve when it was about half finished. The background color at that time was light yellow ochre. And on the bottom, next to the elbow of the saint, a small patch of bright red. And Madame Uspensky said, well, uh, Leonid is trying this color. He's thinking about maybe it's going to be this color, but he's really not sure. So uh, that little patch of color remained on the icon without being painted on the rest of the background for a very long time. Madame Uspensky said to me, I really want it to be this color. So I know she was lobbying, if you will, <laughs> for this color. I don't know how much it influenced him, but the next time I saw the icon hanging in the church of the Rue Saint-Victor, and of course, as you see it now, that red color is very much there. And I think this icon, as well as that beautiful icon uh, uh, in the exhibition of the, the holy women at the tomb, and of course, the deuses icon, um, these icons, with such great clarity, show us our teacher at work. You can see the uh, slight scratches in the gesso. You can see the little bits of early color that get left and not covered up, not cleaned up too much. He said to me once, your icons are too clean. He said, you shouldn't be afraid of a little dirt in the icon. By dirt he meant, as we're drawing the icon and rubbing and fixing and changing that drawing, there's a little bit of a glaze left on the panel. He said, leave that. If it's beautiful, leave that. Incorporate it into the later colors. Um, this was a joyful uh, act of painting that he was able to embark upon. Uspensky told me, it takes humility to finish an icon. You know that when an, when an icon painter finishes an icon, whether it's a panel icon or a fresco, you look at it and one knows I could have done better. And then one knows, I still can do better. Maybe I'll take that away. <laughs> when Father Moses and I are painting frescoes, uh, we'll paint sometimes a large fresco. At the end of the day, or the next day perhaps, we come in, and he says to me, you want to do that again, don't you? And I said, I do. I think we have to. So once in a while, he scrapes it away, all the plaster, and we do it again. But I always have to remember this, uh, this charge from Uspensky. It takes humility to finish. You know you can do better. You want to try to do better, but we have to be humble. We have to say, that's what I did. This is the icon that I painted. This is the icon God gave me, such as I am. And uh, he was a pragmatic, practical man. 
he understood. And he was somebody who took some of this, his work away and redid it. He was somebody who did that, but he also understood. If we iconographers removed everything that we did, there would be no icons painted. And he was practical. Uh, this, the uh, third year that I knew him, my spiritual father, uh, who is uh, the elder of our monastery, his name is Bishop Sergius, so he is still with me, still reminding me of the things that Uspensky said to me when necessary. Uh, bishop Sergius, he wasn't a bishop then, but he came to visit the Uspenskys. And uh, while the four of us were sitting there, he said, well, you've worked with this boy, as I was young at the time, you've worked with this boy for two years now. Should he paint icons or not? And uh, Uspensky thought about it. He didn't seem surprised by the question. It seemed to make sense to him, actually. He said, well, he's young. He's immature, but he's, he's, he's working at it, and he has ability. He said, yes, he should paint icons. And he said, you can paint icons, the church needs icons, so you paint icons. It was that simple. It was not a big emotional statement. It was simply what was said. Um, because if he had said, he's a nice fellow, but I don't think so, I'd have found something else to do. We pupils of Uspensky needed the blessing of our teacher to continue. We understood that we wanted it, um, and, uh, and we needed it. He looked at me once, in, uh, again, towards the end, in 1986, and he said something. Uh, we three were sitting at the table. We had eaten. We were talking. He had grown quiet. He looked at me in a funny way, and he said, he said something. And Lydia, Lydia Alexandrovna, instead of translating, she spoke back to him in Russian. And they had a little conversation. And then both were quiet. And I'm waiting. And I said to Madame Wyszynski, well, what did he say? And she said, oh, nothing. So of course, I, I gave her no peace. <laughs> she said, OK, OK. Leonid says that he feels badly for you. He feels very badly for you. And I said, why? He said, he feels badly for you because you will never be happy with your work. You will always be somehow dissatisfied. And he says, he sympathizes and he feels badly. And I, in my youth, thought I understood this statement and perhaps I did a little bit. But I can tell you that as the years go on, as I get older, I understand this. Because we're never, we iconographers, we're never totally satisfied with our work. And that's difficult. It's difficult for us to go into the church and with everybody else, see our work around us and see, oh, I'd like to fix that. I'd like to fix that. But he taught us that we give our work to God. As the priest proclaims in the divine liturgy, lifting up the gifts of the bread and the wine. Thine own of thine own do we offer unto thee in behalf of all and for all. Uspensky pointed out to us, this is what we are doing in the icons. You can read this in his writings. This is what we as iconographers are doing. We have taken all these things, these materials, and we have offered them back to God, but we have to give them. We give them, absolutely. Um, and uh, that, uh, some of these most severe teachings that he gave me, you are not much of a painter. I feel badly for you. You will not be happy with your work. These, in fact, are the most joyful, liberating things as I continue as an older man painting icons. They are still liberating pieces of really spiritual advice. Uh, once uh, there was somebody who wanted to come and make a movie of Mr. Uspensky painting. And of course, there's a part of all of us that wished that had happened. We would love to see that happening. But of course, there was no question, he said. And he said, uh, next you'll want a movie of me praying. And of course, <laughs> we thought, yes, the, 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 there was no separation of praying 
and painting for him. Of course there wasn't. Before he started painting, he made the sign of the cross two times on himself and then one time on the panel, something again that we students pick up and we can never not do that um, as we would see him doing these things. Icon painting is so difficult because it is so simple. As I got older, I was always thinking about this. And I would, apply, I would apply this saying to most classical and also most sophisticated ancient icons. And I would suggest that you look at the work of our teacher, Leonid Uspensky, uh, in the light of all these icons that have come before. Uh, it is interesting to see how his work is similar to old icons and how his work is different from the old icons. I think the icons, again, of this exhibition show this absolutely. As we look at them, there's something about them that seems absolutely ancient. Um, we saw the icons that are over at uh, the uh, L'Institut du Monde Arabe. And there's a very ancient fragment of an encaustic icon of the Savior, just the eyes. And Father Moses and I were looking at it yesterday. We said, it kind of looks like an Uspensky icon, doesn't it? And of course, we see this. We see these things because he himself studied these ancient icons. Standing before these briefly assembled icons of the exhibition, one is overwhelmed with the beauty, the clarity, the vivid colors, the way everything goes together. It's hard to put it into words, and words certainly fail me. But I do find that as I stand in this exhibition, I forget that I'm here to work as an iconographer and learn and study, and uh, I'm standing before an icon of the Savior. I'm looking at it in one minute, I'm looking at the colors because I need to study them, but then I'm saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me because it's the response that we have. We stand before the icon, and it is, as he said, an encounter. It's the icon facilitates our encounter with the Savior, the Mother of God, the saints. This is part of that iconography is difficult because it's simple, difficult to understand, not just to paint because it's so simple. It's simply presenting again, re presenting the holy persons, the events of sacred history, putting them before us. And I finish with a quote, as Uspensky himself said, in the icon, the church recognized one of the means which can and must allow us to realize our calling, that is, to attain to the likeness of our divine prototype. Let me point out that what does it say uh, on the grave cross of the Uspenskis? I am the image, I am, what does it say from the Panahita service? I am the image of thy divine glory, even though I bear the marks of transgression. To attain to the likeness of our divine prototype, to accomplish in our life that which was revealed and transmitted to us by the God-man. The saints are few in number, but holiness is a task assigned to all. The icons are placed everywhere to serve as examples of holiness, the revelation of holiness, the holiness of the world to come, a plan and a project of the cosmic transfiguration. And that's... That's a little of my experience with Uspensky. Forgive me for the, for the things that I've said that are not profitable uh, and for the things I should have said that might have been profitable. But, uh, and thank you for your patience. Thank you.